What's up? What's up? <laughs> Absolutely nothing? Absolutely nothing. That's correct, man. Um, welcome to episode 19 Chat with Gunner, live right here from Terminal 57. Um, man, crazy week. Last week was uh, crazy. Every week's been crazy now during the corona times and the lockdowns and the shutdowns and uh you know there's it's, it's hard to get people in here it's hard to get guests to come on it's um it's hard to hard to line some things up yeah some difficult the first difficulties of the podcast thus far as far as content is uh is happening this week but the best part about that is that UFC 249 is Saturday, and we are now two days away. So I'm extremely excited for that. Still, I uh, I've been reading the news articles, I've been watching the YouTube videos, I've been listening to the interviews, I have been doing everything that a UFC fanatic would be doing at this time, and uh, I'm excited. I have. I think I've changed some of my picks. Really? I, I think so. Yeah. I uh I've been listening to these breakdown shows. Brendan Schaub and Kenny Florian did a did a great breakdown show. I'm gonna listen to another one. I know that uh Brendan Schaub and Joe Rogan filmed a breakdown show today. So I'll, I guess that comes out tomorrow maybe. Um Luke Thomas has been putting out some good stuff. Chell Sonnen's been putting out some good stuff. The DraftKings guys do a decent podcast. You know, out of all of the podcasts and, and videos and, and interviews and stuff that you see about DraftKings, the guys that suck, like, the most at picking fights are the guys that do the DraftKings <laughs> podcast. <laughs> they don't get many views. Um, they use another guy's name as the name of their show. And they just suck at picking fights like they're just not good at it i don't i i don't like i should have that job I, it should be called the show is uh, titled the pat mayo experience and it's these two other guys that do it and they <laughs> pick the ufc fights and they're awful like they're absolutely god awful at picking these have fights. they ever been right yeah i mean you could guess and get one right every now and then but like when I'm talking about going into details, so like you talk about like the main event and then your key matchups. Being able to like break it down a little bit and give you an idea of what the fight's actually going to look like and then predict the outcome. These guys, whatever they say, go the opposite and you most likely win money. <laughs> I don't maybe, that, maybe that's how they are playing it. Maybe, maybe that's what they're doing. And, and it makes sense that they would be doing that because if they were, they'd be winning a lot of money. I don't know. It's extremely confusing when uh, I'm listening to these so-called experts make their picks on their app that they have no clue what they're talking about. I don't know. And they go like they go so detailed into these matchups, breaking down the stats. Like you ever seen the movie Moneyball? Oh yeah, with uh Brad Pitt. Mm -hmm. So Brad Pitt plays the general manager of the Oakland A's. And uh, it was when they had their best season based off their money ball picks, uh, doing everything statistically because baseball is a game of stats. Anyways, these guys kind of bring that aspect into mixed martial arts. And you know what? Sometimes in baseball when you're throwing a ball at somebody and they hit it, that could be a good stat. But sometimes in fighting, if you get punched 100 times in the face, you might not get knocked out. But if you get punched just once in the face, you might get knocked out. So statistically speaking – it's not always the best way to go. Sometimes it's just about figuring out who's the guy that's going to figure a way to get this job done. So I've had to call some audibles. And we with DraftKings, let's just go ahead and look at it. Hang on. Let's see. Tia texts me. I'm going to text her back real quick. That's <laughs> what this show is? Yeah. That, th <laughs> this show is the uh, quarantine I don't care show. This is I'm just gonna, it's the quarantine we don't know show. Yeah, we don't it's know. just it's the we don't know show. I, is the I was not prepared show. We'll get somewhere eventually. So let me text her back real quick before I get in trouble. <laughs> All you guys out there, y'all know. Um, uh, in middle of the show, middle of show. 
All right. All right, here we go. So what I want to do, first of all, is I want to actually read. This is going to be story time with Gunner. I'm going to read an article that I read earlier that I think that if you are a UFC fan, you should be reading. It's uh, from ESPN.com, and I'll just go ahead and read it, see what happens. See how well I can read on air. It's a challenge for me, I'm trying to increase my my uh my brain my brain waves here all right here we go espn.com ufc 249 how 18 fighters prepared to fight during a pandemic dan lambert sits at the front desk of american top team in coconut creek florida waiting for law enforcement to walk through its doors although it's not open to the public the mma gym has its share of activity of fighters preparing for their upcoming bouts I probably get it three to four times a week, Lambert says, regarding his recent interactions with police. I have to walk them inside and tell them what's going on and explain why we are in compliance with whatever the codes are at that particular time. While gym owners balance complying with new guidelines related to the coronavirus pandemic and helping fighters train, the athletes are looking for the best ways to prepare with fewer training partners than normal. That's one of the main storylines for UFC 249 on May 9th in Jacksonville, Florida. Finding out which fighters were able to get the most out of their training during these unprecedented circumstances. Only fighters who have upcoming bouts can train at American Top Team. And typically, busy mats are now used sporadically and cleaned often. For me, it's actually kind of good because I get a very specialized, specific training from my coaches. Charles Rosa said before leaving Jacksonville to face Bryce Mitchell at UFC 249, it's not like I'm in class with 10 other people in there getting the same amount of attention from one coach. It's still kind of weird. Like, did I do good enough? It's a risk I have to take this fight. Instead of training at Jackson Wink in Albuquerque, New Mexico, fighters are training outside in the mountains, hitting mitts, or training at home. According to the gym's general manager, Michael... Limabov, the unique matter, uh, the unique nature of this preparation could lead to some orthodox fights. It's not going to be pretty in the beginning, Lubinov says. I do not know how good of training you can get when you're isolated from everyone. Donald Cerrone, who faces Anthony Pettis on Saturday, agrees Cerrone expects cardio to be a major factor. There's going to be a lot of early stoppages and not very long fights. People are going to get tired quick, Cerrone says. I don't know what a lot of these guys are training or what they are doing. Is everyone just training in their backyard, their garage, or wherever they can? I just don't know. Who are their training partners? Brett Accomato, Mark Ramanandi, and Mark Rothstein spoke to trainers and more than a dozen fighters on the UFC 249 card before they traveled to Jacksonville and learned about the creative training techniques that they use to deal with this unprecedented challenge. From sparring with their spouse to moving into their gym, here are their stories. So this is the, uh, the 18 different people they, they interviewed, and just some quick quotes. So Tony Ferguson, who was training in Costa Mesa, California, I'm still living my life the same. I'm still doing my thing, which is training. I'm bettering myself every single day. I feel great. The past month has been busy. I started MMA sparring again, so I'm padding up everybody, and I haven't sparred like this in years. I'm having fun again doing what I love. I've been training since December. I've peaked I don't know how many times. I've got this thing down to an art. Justin Gaethje, who was training in Denver. I can't take shortcuts. I can't not have teammates here. Kamara Usman is here. Benelli Dariush is here. And we're all isolated in my house working out together. Neil Magnoff is here. He can push the pace. I just need people to push the pace right now. As an athlete, it's on or off. Green light, red light. I really trust people around me. My coaches, I've never worried about a game plan. I've never asked if there was a game plan. Trevor Whitman instills something and I go out and fight. Afterwards, say, oh, we've been working on this. I really trust the people who are leading me. Dominique Cruz, who was training in San Diego. 
I don't have a lot of people in the gym, especially now with the quarantine. We've all been having to train with minimal people, like four to six people max, so that nobody gets contaminated. It's been pretty silent in there. So I think fight night in the empty arena is going to resemble training in the gym and also similar to the Ultimate Fighter. You had all the competitors on the teams in the Ultimate Fighter in the gym, but it was still eerily quiet. Henry Cejudo, who was training in Scottsdale, Arizona. If anything, I think this quarantine time has been a blessing. Having the gym all to myself, being less distracted. I really don't know when the difference between being in quarantine and being in fight camp. It's all been the same. My shoulder is healed up, and I'm ready to rock and roll this Saturday night. Francis Nungano, who was training in Las Vegas. If you think about it, we were supposed to fight in March. We had a full camp of sparring. We had eight weeks of that. So when the fight was postponed, we took a week off. Then when it was supposed to happen in April and got postponed, we took another week off. That's one thing we're in complete control over is our cardio. So that's the one thing we've been trying to emphasize, is being in good shape. Francis has been doing a lot of good things cardio-wise, but that doesn't equate to his wrestling cardio and grappling cardio. So we've been trying to make up in those arenas where we can because we're short on bodies. So when we get a fellow heavyweight, Blokyov Ivanov, in the gym, I like to see Francis wrestle a little bit more during sparring than normal to make up for those grappling rounds we've been missing throughout the week. We're missing it up, going to the park. We have to stay fresh mentally. Jorgen DeCastro, who was training in Massachusetts. Having the fight canceled a couple of times really bummed me out for a while. I felt like I was in the right spot, physically and mentally, right before it canceled the first time. I was feeling good. My cardio was good. Then the fight was off and I took a couple of days off. I got right back to training when the fight was on, but then it was off again. I just told myself that it is what it is. At this point, it's a mental challenge more than physical. Now I have more time to train. I still go to my two gyms. Both are closed, but my coaches open the buildings for me. I work one-on-one -on -one with my trainers. Michelle Watterson, who was training in New Mexico. The gym is closed down, so there's no training there. They're still trying to limit the amount of people that gather together here in Albuquerque. Luckily, we have a very sweet setup here at my house. We pretty much have everything we need at home. Josh Gomez, my husband, has been primarily holding mitts for me. We've been working a lot of boxing. We have really sweet trails up here to run, so I've been doing that for cardio. But we also have a row machine, an assault bike, a treadmill inside our home gym. All the weight equipment that we need. We have tons of free weight stuff from on it. We have a sauna. Did that just cut off? No, okay, cool. We have a sauna, a cold plunge. We have a swimming pool. So we've got everything that we need. Josh is letting me tee off on him, which is nothing new. He's always been a good sparring partner for me. But the situation has definitely allowed me to work my boxing with him. He started to learn jujitsu about a year and a half, two years ago. So he's been rolling with me now. Each day, we have one of our main coaches come down. So Coach Mike Winklejohn will come down and hold mitts for me at my home gym. My jiu-jitsu coach, Rafael Barada Faridas, will come down and roll with me one-on-one. -on -one. Same with Coach Joey Villasuanor, who works MMA, the ground stuff, and the wall stuff. Just depending on the day, a different coach comes down, and we just work. It's not the same, but I think as fighters, you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable positions. That's what Coach Greg Jackson always talks about. Carla Esparza, who's training in Irvine, California. We're not supposed to go to the gym according to California regulations. A lot of fighters live in a house together. It's almost like your own ultimate fighter house. I've been training with them, like small private sessions. You do what you've got to do. In the fighting world, sometimes you got to fight with injuries. Sometimes you got to fight when you're sick. Sometimes you got to fight after dealing with personal tragedies. The situation is new, but bumps in the road and crazy new things are not new. I think I'm having a good training camp. I don't have access to all my coaches. I would say that's probably the biggest part of it. It's just not having access to all the people I normally would. My strength and conditioning coach, Mike Safi, has a newborn baby, so he's been staying at home. I haven't been doing certain things. It's been tough. Charles Rosa, who was training at Coconut Creek, Florida. 
American Top Team is open for professional athletes. They're very strict about it. There are certain times that fighters can come in with certain coaches and certain training partners. So they spread it out so there's not more than two to three people on the mat at one time. There's a cleaning crew that comes in after and cleans up after you train. I'm cooking every single meal, which is probably better. It keeps my diet more in check. I graduated from culinary school. I went to Johnson and Wales University. Before I was going to be a fighter, I was a hockey player, and I went to culinary school to become a chef. The biggest thing if you don't know about food is the ingredients. Fresh ingredients are key. It's so huge being able to cook and meal prep for myself with quality food. I notice when I see other people like my teammates, I see what they're eating. Like two weeks out from the fight, they're eating dry pieces of chicken and lettuce, and I'm eating sautéed scallops, white wine, garlic, and red peppers. And they're like, man, how did you get to eat that? Donald Cerrone, who was training in Edgewood, New Mexico. I have a whole gym here, so I have no excuse. I got John Wood from Vegas. He drove in. Jafari Vanio drove in. I got a couple guys here at the ranch who are here full time. The good thing is I'm old school. I've taken a million punches. So the days of getting in there and grappling and striking, I don't feel like I mentally have to do that to prepare for a fight. The cardio and just touching up on my bags, the wrestling drills, stuff like that is what I need. Jacare Souza who was training in Orlando, Florida. I think we're doing good. I will be ready. My camp is very good right now. I'm training hard. I'm resting good. I'm eating good. I lived in the gym for many years when I was young in Brazil. Now I'm back. For me, I'm back to normal. My home is my gym. I'm just a little bit strange for me because I have a family now. I have kids and a wife, Larissa. But my coach comes to help me and I have training partners come to my home too. I've been working a lot with Joshua Distek Silva, who trained Paleo Filho when he was in one of the best in the world. I have weights. I have my wife's CrossFit stuff. I can't leave my home right now. Maybe it's better for me because I leave to eat hamburgers and not train hard. I don't like this, but right now I'm strong because she forces me to train. I don't like when we train together because she kills me. Calvin Cater, who was training in New England. We're just ready to go at this point. We've been training since January 5th. Things are a little more remote. The groups are a little more exclusive and limited, but still the same amount, if not more work. And just dialing in with the guys we have. Everyone is focused. It's a good distraction from what's going on. For most of this camp, we traveled all over like we do in a normal camp. We trained in four states, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maine, and Rhode Island. In two countries, the US and Canada. As it got closer and closer, we tightened it up. I've also been working remotely with the UFC Performance Institute in Las Vegas using Omega Wave technology for recovery. There's an app on my phone and a device they gave me. I hook it up, or I hook up EKG pads to my thumb and forehead, wire it to the device, and it connects to my phone app. It sends the data to a more in-depth database where UFC Director of Sports Science Romain Foreman is. He's in charge of this type of stuff. He analyzes all your data more in-depth and gives you feedback on how you're recovering. Him and Heather Linden, the UFC's Director of Physical Therapy, have been awesome. They're both monitoring our workload for training optimization. I've been listening to what they're saying and sending video to Las Vegas boxing coach Jimmy Guilford and Joe Valentini. I feel like we've got a lot of good feedback on the work we're putting in. We've got a lot of eyes on the camp. We're just dialed in at this point and ready to go. Uriah Hall, who was training in Dallas. I know I wanted to get a little bit more uncomfortable, so I decided to move into the gym on April 6th. It's like that Rocky mentality. I have a blown up mattress. I have everything I need here. My teammate, Ryan Spann, has got a place from Airbnb. He's actually fighting on a card. He's got a big house. He's got a room and everything. He told me to come down and stay with him. I chose not to. It's comfortable. I'm not in the mood to be comfortable right now. I do what I've got to do. My boxing coach, Clayton Hires, will be flying, from, flying in from Vegas. We'll be working together, and he'll be in my corner. A lot of people are comfortable, whether it's yourself or whatever you're doing. I ain't got time for that. I've locked myself in with my demons. I sat them all down, and I'm giving them instructions. Ryan Spann, who was training in Dallas. We're taking extra precautions to make sure we keep it real low-key and stay safe and healthy while I train for this. It's a little different. There are some adjustments, but we're making them work. We're having the gym cleaned, cleaning up after ourselves, showering, and making sure when we clean when we get in there. We're getting some good work in there. 
The people that I work with, like UFC fighters Alonzo Menafield and Jeff Neal, are there at the gym. We're getting the same work. It's just a smaller group. It's really the stop-start part that has been the biggest challenge. I don't care who I fight, where I fight them. I've been going so long at this point to the stop-start. We're supposed to have Ovin St. Preux at UFC 247 on February 8th, but he got hurt. Then it was going to be Paul Craig at the UFC London on March 21st, and that card got canceled. Who am I fighting now? Oh, Sam Alvey? They moved the Alvey fight from April 18th. It just start, stop. I cut a shit ton of weight for the original fight with Alvey on just two and a half weeks notice. I lost about 13 to 14 pounds. Uh... I'm on track, though. Even though I cut a lot of weight a few weeks ago, I was on track to have one of the easiest cuts I've had. I think this time it's going to be real easy, too. My strength conditioning coach, Mike Scacia, is a mad scientist, and he's coming out there to Jacksonville with us. He's going to help me with the final steps of the process, the rehydration, and everything. It's going to be nothing. It won't be fun, but it will be nothing. Sam Alvey, who's training in Temecula, California. The biggest difference for me is I don't have to teach any of my kids' classes or my team's classes at Dan Henderson's Athletic, Faci- athletic Fitness Center in Temecula, California. That's really been pretty helpful. I've had more time to do other training. It's really been the easiest camp I've ever had because I didn't have to teach anything. This is the first time I've ever had that be the case. I've been able to get a bunch of different gyms. I've had plenty of training partners, a lot of them who just travel with me. We get to work together just at different locations all the time. I've been working with Tom Galakikio, Joe Stevenson, and Dan Henderson. He's been giving a helping hand, but I've had a quite a few training partners. Anthony Pettis, who was training in Milwaukee. The first week, everybody was skeptical. I made everyone send me their temperatures before I cleared them to come to the gym. As the weeks went on, it just kind of felt more normal. I felt like I'm in a training camp without the distractions. I own businesses. When I'm in training camp, usually, not only am I worried about the fight, I have to make sure my gyms are doing right and are afloat. My barber shops, my sports bars, I have a lot of shit going on with this one. Nothing is going on because my businesses are closed. I literally just have to worry about fighting. This time I was really forced to reinvent my training camp. If you just take a normal week on a professional fight team, you all train at 1.30 p.m., there's 20 people on a team, probably 10 high-level guys. That practice is made for 10 guys as opposed to one guy. This whole training camp, every single practice was catered to what I need specifically to win. It feels good to be in this spot mentally. It's the easiest training camp of my life. It's weird to say that. This quarantine opened up my eyes. It made me slow down. I had to slow down, pull back, and look at my life from the outside. It made me simplified. I think for me, honestly, this was a blessing to do training camp this way because it forced me to reinvent it. I own my own gyms, so that's a blessing for me. Training partners, and I had to be very selective, and that's what I loved about it. This time, it's like, okay, I need this guy. I need this guy, these coaches. From now on, I'll do my training camp this way. My main training partner has been my little brother, Bellator fighter Sergio Pettis. Fabricio Verdum, who was training in Los Angeles. The pace of training is very good, although it is not normal without the usual routine and going to the gym. Master Rafael Cordero is doing online training with me on Skype, on Zoom. Cordero is also coming here traveling two hours from Big Bear. Ricardo Tesfaye is here, and he's helping me a lot. He was, he's my sparring partner. He comes and goes. Sometimes he stays for a day or two. My brother is right here with me. When there is no one to do the sparring or anything, he does the gauntlet. I'm running too, running on the mountains or streets. I'm just not working out, you know. I can't do weight training, but the rest is fine. Of course, it's different from everything we have lived through. Do online training? I never imagined that I would do online training with the teacher, but it's been good. Vicente Luque, who was training in Brazil and Florida. I have good teammates, good training partners, but we're managing and limiting the people in the gym to just me and one other guy. We're in the gym, but the gym is closed. Nobody else can come. We work, just the two of us. I studied a lot of my opponent's fights. I'm in the contact I'm in, I'm in contact with my psychologist, my physical trainer, and my fight coach, Daniel Barrios Evangelista, who is my head coach, my trainer here in Cerrado, Durano, and Henry Hooft, who will be in my corner in Florida when I go there. So I'm feeling very well despite the situation. I am prepared to fight. All right. So that was a pretty lengthy article, about a, like a 17-minute read, but... 
I think as a uh, a guy that analyzes sports and as a fan of sport and as a former high level athlete myself, I look at that and I I take a lot of what those guys are saying and I try to relate it to what I would do if I was in the exact same situation. And I liked what some of the people said, and I didn't like what others said. Um, just to try to kind of remember and point some things out. The, the best one out of the bunch, I believe, was Uriah Hall. It stood out to me because he said that, you know, the gyms are closed and all this stuff, and there's all these different uh, excuses you can give yourself as to why you can't make it to the gym. Well, he moved into the gym. He literally just put a air mattress in the weight room. So he has no excuse. He's he's going with the uh, the most drastic solution, uh, the most over-the-top solution, which is something that I could see myself doing. That's like if they told me, hey, Gunner, you got to fight in a couple months, but you now we're on lockdown and you know you don't know really who you're going to be with i would i would find my sparring partners i would grab my coaches and i would grab my my safety blanket of people that i need around me to be successful and i would move them into a small house into a gym into a warehouse something something like that and just get after it and you know a lot of these guys are focusing on uh, their training specifically, which I find a little strange. I didn't realize that in the MMA world that the guys didn't get as much individual coaching as they should. Um, I'm sure your top camps, like a guy like McGregor, um, Tony Ferguson, uh, maybe Khabib, maybe not at American Kickboxing Academy, but you would think these guys get more specific coaching than they do. And it, it sounds as if they don't, which is interesting to me. Um, but it, it feels like this is going to be a different card based on the situation that all of the fighters are in. I don't like hearing that Fabricio Verdum can't get to a weight room and he's like not lifting weights i don't like that i don't like um the fact that guys are just they're focusing on some parts of their training but not the whole the whole thing it's strange it's uh it's made me that article is the reason why i have decided to change a few of my picks for the fight um what I actually want to do, I want to read off my DraftKings because um, several people have reached out to me from last week's episode asking me to, to give some picks. So let's go ahead and, and do that. We've got, uh, I put four lineups out, I believe. No, I put more than that. One, two, three, four, five, six. I put six lineups out. Um, because that's how many weeks we didn't have DraftKings. So I decided to go ahead and just put them all on this one. I have uh, several different cards where, you know, I have it flip-flop. So, for example, on one of them, I have Dominic Cruz winning. Uh, on another one, I have Henry Cejudo winning. Uh, on several, I have Tony Ferguson winning. On several, I have Justin Gaethje winning. On several, I have Anthony Pettis winning. On several, I have Donald Cerrone winning. Um, on several, I have uh, Michelle Waterson winning. On several, I have Esparza winning. On several, I have uh, Jacara Souza winning. On several, I have Uriah Hall. So it kind of just depends. Um, but if I had to actually sit down and, and pick, you know, if there was no salary cap, no limit, if I had to pick who I just think is going to win these fights, um, after hearing some of the, the breakdowns and and analysis and reviews and mindset from the other professionals and then hearing the guys actually tell us how they're training right now and some of the uh, predicaments that they're running across and some of the issues I uh, I have a different outlook on it and 
I think that the main event, Tony Ferguson and Justin Gaethje, is a trap for Tony. But then at the same time, man, Tony is such a savage. I just he's got a completely different mindset. I just I don't know. That's the one fight where I think you could literally flip a coin. Justin Gaethje could knock Tony out within the first two rounds, or Tony could wear him out for five. And could go either way. Story of both those guys' careers. Um, the cardio worries me a little bit. I know Tony will be in shape. I don't know about Justin uh, as far as his training and stuff goes. So that's why I say two two rounds. Brendan Schaub and Kenny Florian brought up some great points as it regarded Dominic Cruz versus Henry Cejudo. And it was that they think that Dominic Cruz is going to get the job done. Now, if you listened to this show last week, I was gung-ho on Henry Cejudo being like one of the my for sure wins. Looking back at it, if Dominic Cruz fights the fight that Brendan Schaub and Kenny Florian talked about on the uh, Blow the Belt podcast. I think it's going to be hard for Henry Cejudo to pick this win up. I actually think that Dominic Cruz could be the odd favorite in this one. Um, So I've switched over to Dominic Cruz, I believe, on, on that fight. And the Bryce Mitchell, Charles Rosa fight, I didn't know that Charles Rosa was training out of American Top Team. And I don't know how well Bryce Mitchell is being able to train at the moment. So I think any other time these guys would fight, Bryce Mitchell would be the guy to go with. But under these circumstances, I think Charles Rosa might be the guy to go with. Um, So I would would change my pick to him. As far as uh, Carla Esparza and Michelle Watterson, I'm – 100% 100% sold on Carla Esparza now based off of her wrestling background and Michelle Watterson's lack thereof and the fact that she's tra- or she's sparring with her husband. You Girls can't spar with guys and get uh, the same look that another girl would give them. It's just, there's just something to that. Like you, just because you, you know, you're a 135 pound girl and you're sparring with a 135 pound guy, there's n- no comparison there. That it's still not equal, um, so it's hard for girls to train with guys, in my opinion, in any sport. So with that one, I got Carla Esparza, and then what, let's see the Greg Hardy, the the Castro fight. That's gonna somebody's getting knocked out. It's gonna be up in the air. But uh, the Donald Cerrone Anthony Pettis fight, it's kind of got me thinking as well. You know. Donald does have his own gym, but so does Anthony. So, like, they've they've both been in the game for a while. They both have their own gym. They're both doing their training for them. Cowboy says he's not sparring, so maybe that has something to do with getting knocked out so much here recently. I think that Anthony Pettis is probably going to get him again, and I think Cowboy's about done. Um, But I thought that was a really good article by ESPN to put out, and and it's just very interesting right now to look at this whole thing this is the first first sport back, but even at some of the biggest facilities, the cops are coming in and having to like do walkthroughs and check the facilities and make sure that people aren't too close to each other and they're following the social distancing guidelines. I don't know. It's uh strange times for me for sure. So there there was a little bit more of a an in depth look at the UFC two forty nine. Ethan, anything else going on? Not really. Not it's really? Well, been a quiet week. As far as uh, in the fight world, I saw uh, Mike Tyson posted a video of him hitting mitts, and he's going to do a comeback fight at oh, 53 Lord. years old, and he's, like, actually in good shape right now. I mean, has Mike Tyson ever not been in good shape? He, there, yeah, there's been some times. Um, he's put on a little bit of weight. Like, in September last year, he wasn't in good shape. Now he's – like sh- jacked again and ready to fight. It's strange to me. The only thing about Mike right now, Mike's he you know he owns his own weed ranch and own like he's got all that going for him. But he's also like big in the DMT with Rogan, so he's he's on out there right now. But he says he's mentally he's in a better spot now than he's ever has been. So that's kind of cool. Um, 
What else is going on? I saw where Evander Holyfield was thinking about coming back out of retirement as well. That'd be a cool fight to see those guys get back at it in their 50s. That'd be cool. Um, What else? I saw that, uh, not in sports news, but in uh, politics. So, I guess uh, the White House, or not the White House, but Donald Trump has a new press secretary. Again? Well, this was as of April 7th. So okay. Pull pull her up. See what her name is. I actually don't have it right here. She's a uh, she's a stud, bro. As far as like, she's a lawyer from Harvard and fairly young. What was her name? Kay. Here you go. Kaylee McKinney. McKinney. Um, McKinney. McKinney. Maybe. I think so. Dude, she. <laughs> you need to find this video. It's pretty short of the uh, media attacking Trump for, you know, saying back in like January or February that what this COVID-19 wasn't going to be a big deal. And they wanted to know like what she thought about him saying that back then. And then she just, it was like she was waiting for that question. And she just lit the media up with like everything that they had been saying from the Washington Post and the New York Times and the, CNN and MSNBC and all these different uh, news sources of them saying that it wasn't going to be a big deal, wasn't an issue, this is a joke, that type of stuff. She goes, so when you guys uh, decide to answer why you said what you said, then maybe we'll have the president answer why he said what he said. And just kind of mic dropped and walked off. So that was kind of cool. Hoorah for the Republican Party there. Um, man, what else going on? Anything else going on in the world? I don't know. Not really. I uh, I meant to tell you. So I reached out. I don't know if you saw the email. I reached out to uh, the main actor, and I think he might have a uh, maybe like an executive producer spot in a movie called Badland. Either Badland or Badlands. Uh, the guy's name is Kevin. Look it up real quick. I'll tell the whole story of why I even brought this up, but let's see. His name Kevin Mackley, and he he's been in several movies, none that have been like uh, big blockbuster type films, but been in several movies. And he was in this Badland movie, and it's a western film, kind of like a throwback Clint Eastwood type movie. I like what I'm hearing. Yeah, very good. It's on Netflix, and I watched it uh, at the beginning of the quarantine is when I watched it. And, like, from the day it released till that weekend, it was, like, first through – or top ten on the Netflix ranking system. So I watch it, and this guy is uh, I mean, pretty jacked guy in good shape. Play Just played a good cowboy, like a good kind of rough – Bad cowboy is what he. It's mm-hmm. it, it a good throwback. Anyways, went to his Instagram, saw some other stuff that he did. He was in like a Bigfoot movie. Yeah, so pretty cool stuff. Um, dude's got a beard. We uh, kind of resemble each other. This may be one of the reasons I reached out to him, but he didn't have many Instagram followers. So I messaged him uh, to his email and asked him that if he'd want to come onto the show kind of hyped it up as far as it being on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, and I showed him all the ratings and screenshots and uh, told him that we had a lot in common as far as fitness, and we got a home gym, a garage gym, and all these different things, and today, he finally got back to me and said, absolutely, would love to do it. Let's get together. So, I think that'll be coming up here probably within the next few weeks. Sounds doing good to a, me. Yeah, doing a little webcam interview with... Kevin Mackley from Badlands on Netflix. Get our first uh, first legit actor in studio. Oh, man. Yeah. So that'll be fun. Um, another thing we're going to do, we need to get this set up. It was going to be tonight, but we moved it last minute. Um, my buddy Jacob Huseman, quarterback, UTC, he's going to – he's coaching right now at UTC, and he's going to get with Jay Blackman who's our media guy, and get some of our old game film. 
So what we're going to do is I'm going to get some of the guys to come in here that I played with, and we're going to throw up some old games, and we're just going to like do like a fight companion, but from some of our old film and just kind of. I don't hate it. To, yeah, I, I don't think, hate that idea yeah, at all. I think it'd be great. Oh yeah, and with with us owning the or having the actual uh, film, we'll be able to put it up where they can see the game in the background and us kind of commentating and talking about it. Shouldn't be a problem. Oh yeah, I don't think. No. So that'll be fun. That's kind of coming up. Um, but that's about it. I don't think anything else. It's cool. a short show. Not much to talk about. Elon Musk was on a uh, Rogan's podcast today. Oh yeah, it's so good. Yeah, I, I can't. I, I, I got new headphones. Yeah, what, you, what headphones did you get? I got uh some uh, Anchor headphones. Okay. They're wireless. They're like eighty dollar AirPods. Oh, okay. Basically, they're Ooh. so nice. Yeah. Sweet. And I was just like, what do, what am I going to use? These headphones for first. Yeah. Joe Rogan's podcast. <laughs> that was the first thing I thought of. I was like, yeah. I just want to listen to people talk. Yeah. It's all I need. Right. And that's, uh, to me, that's a good barometer for hearing. Oh, yeah. Uh, in, in new headphones is how well can I hear somebody talk? So do those headphones, does it cancel out any noise at all? Or is it just kind of? It's it not uh, like digitally. Yeah. Mechanically, it's just it in your headphones. Bit. Yeah. So... I've I've been through some headphones out there. I uh, the ones I have right now I like the most are the Project Rock. The, of course, but not because <laughs> of the the sound quality. It they literally like stick on your head. Like they oh, yeah. like you could run, jump, do a flip. They're not gonna come off. Where I've had the uh, the I think I had had the Sony headphones, the nice ones. Yeah, and they were incredible sound quality. Mm-hmm. Noise can. Sony is one of the best. Like it's Sennheiser, Sony, and I'm forgetting the third one Bose. that I always yeah Bose. I always go to looking first. Yeah. And then realizing I don't have the kind of money for those headphones, I'll bring well, it. Back. I was just I, I, that was like <laughs> one of those stupid decisions I made. And I I've had like the uh, the Beats. I think the Beats suck. Beats are good for what they're what the demographic is of like heavy bass yeah. and listening to music. Yeah. I don't always listen to music. I mean, either so. I, I like to put headphones in and like watch a movie. Or exactly. Like, you know, like, like I just want to zone into that movie, mm-hmm. whatever it is. Anyways, so yeah, Elon Musk is on uh, Joe Rogan's podcast today. I listened to about an hour and 30 minutes of it. I'm about halfway, I think. Yeah. I don't know. Didn't realize by the time I got here. It's, uh, it's good because you – you, it's hard to see how smart Elon Musk is by listening to him because he, as far as like his uh, language comes across or like the way he communicates, you wouldn't think that he is as smart as he is. But I feel like his com- his brain, his computer, I feel like it just is moving faster than what any, he can talk. Than what he can talk or like how he can like describe it to you. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's something with people that are, I don't want to like get into like IQ numbers or something, but people that are smart aren't always the best communicators yeah. vocally, right? Because that because that's a whole different skill set. Mm-hmm. They've got so much packed into their brain that they just can't talk about it to, in layman's terms. Yeah, if they if they just start talking about, I mean, Joe Rogan's had past few weeks guys that are talking about like astrophysics and quantum mechanics. Yeah, and it's hard to keep up with mm-hmm. Joe. Joe admits like, I have no idea what you just said, yeah. <laughs> but like, that's, that's how you have to talk about it sometimes. Yeah. And with stuff like Elon, what he's doing, like Neuralink and stuff, it's, yeah. it's a level above. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, to think that potentially he says within a year, but potentially, so let's just call it 10 years, 10, five, let's just call it 10. <laughs> I'm not ready for it. Let's just call it <laughs> 10 years. That you can drill into your skull a couple of millimeters and put a computer chip that has wires that connect to your brain. Yeah. Here's the thing. It's not that far off from pacemakers, like he says, and anti-seizure uh, ex- uh, procedures. Yeah. It, it's It's something that isn't so far out of the realm of possibility anymore. We are already doing it. Uh, I think that the way 
he's saying it should be used as far as medically is yes. But what's going to happen, like anything, is we're going to take this and say, oh, well, this is the new iPhone. It's called iBrain. iBrain. Yeah, you just <laughs> hook up your... It'll be really shitty after about five years. Yeah. Good luck. Well, and the uh, <laughs> what we were talking about in uh, several episodes back where we were talking about um, being a... Uh, cyborg. Cyborg. Yeah. That's that's, I mean, that's the next step. Yeah. It it's it taking it, I think he said it on the last time he was on Joe Rogan, taking the phone away where the phone is part of your brain, part of your body, yeah. whatever. And I think there was a step of the step before this was Google Glass, even though people hated it because it had a camera on it and yeah. breach of privacy or whatever. But right. like having hands-free information beamed to you from your glasses yeah. that's something else that's that's a that's another step that we weren't ready for now whether we're going to be ready for neuralink where you can be on your computer in the middle of nowhere yeah that's interesting well and then he he was mentioning that you know how far are we away from not having to speak to communicate within yeah. 10 years yeah and we're not for talking sure. about texting or like you know, email. We're talking about like reading each other's thoughts, like having. I mean, it, it it's still going to be some sort of like interface within Neuralink. You'll yeah. you'll probably he- be able to hear somebody when they're thinking of something and they're trying yeah. to beam it to you. But the fact that you don't have to use your mouth, make sounds like a bunch of monkeys, just using words and making noises. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't know. I don't know if I like it at all. I don't know if I want to be a part of that whole movement. I, I mean, I think it's I'm going to be honest here. I'm ready for it. I'm I, down for it. I mean, I guess, I don't know, man. I d- nobody's drilling into my skull. <laughs> um, and I'm well, don't they'd have to get through the three inches first. Yeah, and I don't want uh, wires connected to my brain. Fair enough. I mean, like that, that is the weirdest part is that it's going to be such a risk to take because you're drilling into your brain and putting yeah. wires in it. I don't, that's not lost on me. It's yeah. just the idea of what it could do beyond that. So now let's break it down. Let's take it back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the show, which is the UFC. I wonder if Neuralink would be like what you see in all those sci-fi movies where the fighters know like what punch is coming and they know they get how Sherlock to, vision. They, yeah they know how to duck and where the angles are coming from the degrees and the force and here's the, power. the thing it, we we haven't been able to do it because nobody wants to get I, I'm not I'm not sure if anybody wants to get in the cage with a, a robot nor do I think we have a robot that can fight people yet hopefully not you ever um, seen Robocop I mean I have but like we haven't seen the computational degree at which a computer can fight somebody. So I don't know if that's if it's applicable yet on that scale of neural link. But I think there there is going to be somebody's gonna be able to punch harder, run faster, and do a lot of things better than just a normal human because a computer is sending the pulses instead of your brain. Well, yeah, everything that we do is an electrical wave. Um, something electrical is firing in the mm-hmm. brain in order to, you know, everything that we see, smell, all of our senses are all, you know. Just electrical. Electrical. Chemicals so and electrics. If you can uh, if you can mess with that a little bit, that could get a little bit interesting. Well, I mean, what if, say, you're trying to, say, lift 100 pounds? If you've never done it before, you probably won't be able to do it. But what if there's something in your brain that the computer can just flip a switch and just tell your tell your muscles keep going even if you're ripping yourself ripping apart yeah well you know there's something to that there is uh, a type of visual training that a lot of people are going through these days like a like a meditative type training or a uh, a lot of you know sports teams will practice without the ball walkthroughs <laughs> Yeah, but it it sounds stupid, but it makes a lot of sense. If you if you can get all the movements down without the actual uh, 
you know, tool or equipment that you're using to perform the sport, once you incorporate that, it should just be smooth. And if you can, they say that like if some Olympic swimmers and Olympic athletes, they would just every night as they're going to sleep or they take 10, 15 minutes of visualizing themselves winning whatever sport they're playing and they were at, uh, hooking them up to these brain wave breeding machines or whatever, MRIs and whatever like it was. And like when you could tell in their dreams or in their, the movements of the, the brain patterns or the waves when they like what they were doing in, in their thoughts based Weird. on like it was activating certain things in the brain S- the same things it would activate if you were actually doing actually running actually that makes sense yeah so there's something to that and i know that like uh, when i was in college they'd always say like if i had a big lift coming up the next day or a max out day i would try to visualize myself lifting that weight and if i had any second any second guessing or any, like any doubt that i couldn't do it i couldn't that, that's still that's still like true today. If I don't think that I can do something, it I can't do it. That's fair. Isn't that weird? I mean, it makes sense because you're not gonna, you're not gonna be all in. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a realistic aspect to some of the things that I think I can and can't do, and some things I'll kind of surprise myself like I think I can do that maybe, but if I know I can't do something, I can't. I, it just won't happen. So yeah. I try to. I try to be smart with the way I train, especially when I'm like a training partner. But um, yeah, that's interesting to, to see if we could almost like, uh, have you ever seen Limitless? Yes. Great movie. Great movie. Well, in that movie, they, they speak about how, and they talk about this in studies too, about how we only use 10% of our brain or 15 or 20. It's not true. It's not but true. Uh, they, they say that we do have access to the majority of our brain. Which Majority. Uh, who knows <laughs> what anybody's talking about, to be honest with you. Nobody nobody really knows the brain. I think the adage comes from, like, the 10% of your brain comes from the idea that you can only focus on one thing or two things or a set number of things at a time, yeah. and your brain can't do everything that you do in a day no. all at once. Yeah, so to that point, literally multitasking is not real. No. You can do several things at the same time and not do them well. Yeah. But you can only do one thing at a time, even yeah. if that one thing is at one second and you do the next thing for the next second. Exactly. You're, You're not th- able to just yeah. – there are there are some people that can, like, play multiple chess games all at once. That's interesting. They yeah. can paint different paintings at the same time. Yeah. But I don't think – they're actually doing two things at once. They're just able to rec- recollect what they were doing from a few minutes prior yeah. and do, can continue to do that well. Yeah, that's strange too. So, I mean, I don't know. As far as Neuralink, I think I think something interesting for you to look up is a game coming out called Cyberpunk 20, 2077. And it's 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 weird. So, my, uh, my buddy at... My previous employer, Lipsy, um, Jared Jones. He's the one that trained with me, and I, he lost all that weight anyways. Huge video game nerd. Yeah. He'd, yeah. he'd admit to that. Like, he loves that shit. Um, he told me about Cyberpunk maybe a year ago. Yeah, it's, it, it's it's been coming for a while. He was like, the next, because he knows I like, like Grand Theft Auto, those type yeah. games. He goes, if you like that, the next game you want to play is Cyberpunk. And I was like, okay. And then yeah. so I saw a trailer for it the other day. It's, it's real weird. <laughs> it's it's obviously set in 2077, but it's in a future where we go full in on cybernetic enhancement and uh, cutting the divide between man and machine. And there, I mean, there are, I think the basic premise is like your character has some kind of trauma and keep seeing this. Keanu Reeves is in it. That was a big yeah, saw point that, a, few, yeah, yeah. a few years ago. But he keeps seeing Keanu Reeves, who's a guy that's dead. Mm. But he's been uploaded basically mm. to the internet. And he keeps seeing this ghost. And this ghost is trying to help him be a revolutionary. Mm. It's pretty interesting. But it's, yeah, Neuralink. Mm. You can upload yourself to the internet from your brain? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, Elon was talking about like being able to 
hang out with your 30 year old self yeah because you just it, it if you, you could take a snapshot of your brain you save your save your game data and just, exactly it's, it's pretty much <laughs> save what you're talking game about. State. oh man but uh in the cyberpunk tell me if i'm wrong and you might not have seen it i think i saw it today you can edit the genitalia of your <laughs> character yes. uh that is something that has come out um the, i mean let's be honest here if our, if we go full in on cybernetic enhancements and r- uh, implants and prosthetics, what's to say that you can't just upload yourself into a new body and or just change the parts on your body like you do a car or a computer or your phone? Well, that's what I said about when we were talking about the cyborg thing a few weeks or months or whatever, how, whenever it was ago. I was like, dude, I mean... I'm all down for that. Like I just if live forever, just upload my consciousness into a similar body like the rock and I'm cool with it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's perfect. It, it's the, the concept of who you are kind of just fizzles away because yeah. it, it's, it's an old adage from uh, star Trek because it say you get teleported somewhere else. The way the teleportation works in star Trek is they take every atom and then just, replace it somewhere else yeah. but who's to say that same ad all of the atoms that are making up the second person that comes out is the same exact person that you were <sighs> it's wild it's weird it's crazy life is makes me uncomfortable. a sci-fi movie <laughs> <laughs> yeah plagues and everything yeah i saw somebody today posted uh 2020 is what 2012 wanted to be <laughs> 2012 ran, walked so 2020 could run. <laughs> yeah, dude. I keep seeing the, uh, I keep bringing it up to here at the studio, but this is all because they killed that damn gorilla. Right, Harambe, <laughs> yeah. whatever his name was. I saw where uh, today was the first day that uh, GW Zoo was back in business. Old Tiger, Tiger King Zoo. <laughs> oh, man. And uh, <laughs> it was like the, the most people they've ever had on site ever in a day. Good for them. Yeah. I mean, I I can only say this. I hope that the people that are working there are getting paid to compensate. I'm sure. And also, did you see where Nicolas Cage is, is going to play? He's going to play Joe Tiger Exotic. King? Yes. Yeah. We talked about that on Rejected. That's, that's uh, so crazy. That's good stuff. It's going to be a. Uh, I'm ready for some some more movies to be made because I'm running out of movies to watch. Oh yeah, you saw Train to Busan, right? <sighs> uh, yeah, and I'm actually watching another. That was great. I am watching another kind of. It actually has some English in it, so, yeah. and I watch every show with subtitles, so it doesn't yeah. matter to me. But it has some English in it, but it is a lot of other language as well. What is it? Uh, Into the Night. Haven't heard of it. So it's new. It's a series on Netflix. And it's about, uh, it starts like in a terminal at an airport, and a terrorist comes on, hijacks the plane, gets up in the air, and he tells the plane to keep flying west. Why? Because that's where the dark is. That's where the night is. And on the ground, into the world is happening wherever the sun hits. So they're trying to just stay west and keep refilling up with fuel and staying west because if you get hit with the sun, you're dead. That's weird. So they're just... Trying to outrun the sun. It's pretty good. I mean, yeah. That I mean, that's not scientifically not impossible. Yeah. That's. I mean, if you're on Mercury, you're close to the sun. If you're in the sunlight, you're dead. If you're not, you're probably really cold. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird. It's strange. That's pretty good. Uh, also, what's watch- the, uh, there was a show on Netflix I keep wanting to watch. It's Midnight something. Uh, oh, uh, Midnight War? Yeah. I haven't seen it, but I... No, Midnight War? I think... No, it's like animated. Oh, okay. I haven't seen that. Then. Midnight. I'm talking about Bennett's War. It's the Midnight same. Gospel. Midnight. I haven't seen that. It's uh, it's really weird. It's uh from the guys that made the animator that did uh Adventure Time. Mm-hmm. So, I'm kind of into it. Gotcha. But uh, it's I think it's, I think the concept that I was told was like, it's just people talking about their drug experiences. Oh, okay. And then it's just animated. Yeah. Well, animated is good for drugs. Oh that, yeah, that's a good way to get that across. Mm-hmm. And it's um, just it's just people talking. Uh, another thing I watched, I watched it last night. It was great. Um, Jerry Seinfeld. 
he's got a new routine on Netflix. Okay. And it's I'm good. listening. Yeah, <laughs> it's really good. He uh he's he talks about like how friends interact with each other and how we really don't like each other. That's one of the things. Nobody really likes. Yeah, that's one of the things. And then he talks about how um, sucks and great is actually the same thing because the the people like everything sucks and is great to someone. Yeah. Like as far as a movie goes, I heard it sucks. Oh, really? I heard it was great. I heard it started out really great, but then it sucks. Like there's only two ratings now that we use in 2020, (laughs) which is. That thing sucks, or that thing's great. great. There's yeah. no like, eh, it's all right. There's no nuance. Yeah. So that was that was pretty cool, and and he he tells the whole story about how, you know, everybody knows how he lives, everything he's done, the money he's got, you know. Nobody asks how he is. Right. <laughs> he's he's like, you know, why am I still doing this? Because I enjoy it. It's not for the money. Good. I, I could do this for free. I'm doing this because I I enjoy being in front of an audience. So that's cool. Jerry Seinfeld just. Always cool to see. Um, what else have I seen that's been good here recently? Um, you, you watch Outer Banks yet? No. Nah. It's good. I watched all of that. <laughs> good. I've watched so much shows. So much on Netflix. Um, Outer Banks was good. Have you seen Waco? I've heard of it. Waco's great. Waco was good. Extraction. We've talked about that, right? I, th- I think so, yeah. Extraction was good. Yeah, Netflix is crushing it right now with releases. They probably <laughs> they're probably going to be like crawling by the end of the year because yeah. they're just pushing everything out yeah. now. And their stocks up too. Netflix yeah. stocks up. All the streaming fine. services, all their stocks are oh, up. Yeah. Amazon stocks up. I think I saw today that Disney Plus is set up a whole lineup of like Marvel stuff oh, yeah. just to keep shit going. Uh, Spider Man's getting a, a show on Disney Plus. Which sounds amazing. <laughs> uh, I watched my f- new favorite Spider-Man. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Yes. It's so good. That's my favorite Spider-Man. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sting is in the room, and Sting has already said that he d- doesn't want... It. Yeah, he doesn't like didn't it. Didn't like the Spider-Verse movie? Yeah, I didn't like that one. No. Well. Uh, what an asshole. You see that, uh, you see that they announced today they're doing a National Treasure the TV uh, series, series what? for Disney yeah. Plus, but which I Nicolas love Cage. those movies. <laughs> I'm not a huge Nick Cage fan, but you should be. Damn, like, yeah, what those else? were good movies. Oh yeah. What else are they doing? That's the that's the kind of movie I like. I don't know alternate history that I like is like yeah. it's not conspiracy theories. It's not like super crazy. It's just like history. But what if? Yeah. Um, they were doing a. Uh, I see they're already filming Mandalorian three. So that I mean when three? Does, yeah. So when does Ooh. season two come out? Season two is supposed to come out this fall. Yeah, they're so, supposedly they're already in the works for filming season three. Yeah, right. Dave Filoni just wrapped up uh, Clone Wars, which was a big deal. Mm-hmm. It was just on May the fourth, which was Monday. That's the animated. Series. Yeah, the animated series. Which I'm gonna be honest with you, if you even semi like Star Wars. The beginning of Clo- Clone Wars is like an anthology series. It's just like. The stories that happened during the Clone Wars, but by the end of, I think, the third or fourth season, it starts picking up of, like, okay, let's tell a con- cohesive story where you're following Anakin and Obi-Wan and, you know, Darth Sidious and all of the people. Darth Maul comes back. It's, it's the show that makes Darth Maul everyone's favorite nowadays. Uh, I gotcha. Uh, and here recently, obviously, Clone Wars leads right up to episode three. Order 66. Gotcha. And it was supposedly really fucking good. Oh. I haven't I haven't sat down and watched all of it. What? The new Star Wars? The Clone Wars? There's like seven seasons? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> 20 episodes close to of the first few. I've got a list of like, here's the episodes you need to see. Oh, okay. And it's still a really long list. Jeez. <laughs> um, another show that has a bunch of seasons and episodes is Grey's Anatomy. You guys ever watch that? Uh, my mom used to be into it. So I didn't realize how old it was. <laughs> Tia just started watching Grey's Anatomy. Why is everyone on Grey's Anatomy right now? I, I'm assuming because it's on Netflix. It's Netflix. And it's kind of like when Friends is on Netflix. and you Yeah. Know, it's kind of... Which yeah. reminds me. HBO picking up Friends and like a they, bunch of other didn't stuff. Didn't they get South Park? Yeah. I think so. That's crazy. Yeah. One thing that you guys need to watch 
if you like Grey's Anatomy, same creator, but the show is just phenomenal, especially if you're into politics. It's Scandal. Ooh, I love Scandal. Scandal. Really we already we finished it. Scandal. Yeah, oh, yeah, Scandal's great. Yeah, Scandal's incredible. I haven't watched the whole last season, but so we t- before you came in here, we were talking about the uh, the new press secretary for the White House. Yeah. Um, what happened to what's her name? Well, exactly. I think it's, it's, who? It wasn't like McCain or whose daughter was that? No, it's it's McCa- It's she's been there since April seventh. So she's been there for a no, month. The new chick that was the press sec or the old chick that was the press secretary wasn't she like Rom not Romney? I don't no. know. The new one is Kaylee McCainy. Anyways, she's very intelligent and she's uh, extremely like bitchy with the reporters, and I love it. It's great. Mm-hmm. Um, but she reminds me of kind of like the chick from Scandal. Like I could see that whole thing happening. Oh, it was she- Mike Huckabee's daughter, Sarah H- Sarah Sanders. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It was Mike Huckabee's daughter. What happened to her? I have no clue. I think I think I remember hearing something about it. She was just like, I think nobody's happened. listening. Nobody's listening to me. Yeah. Like, what's the point? I mean, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't. It was less Trump and more the press. Yeah. And I, so. I you know what? I get it because yeah. I could imagine one being anybody in Trump's uh, <laughs> office, but let alone having to talk to the people that hate Trump the most. Right. Fuck that. <laughs> Crazy times. Crazy, Crazy times. times. Um, scandal was good. Uh, that chick is also in a good show on Hulu now. Uh, Carrie Washington. Carrie, yeah, Carrie Washington. She's also hot. And uh, uh, Renee, or no, Renee, Reese Witherspoon are in a show on Hulu called Little Fires Everywhere or something. It's actually good, too. If you're into chick flicks, I got gotcha. you. Let me hook up. Hey, you know what? got to watch two or three of them. Yeah, I like them. I dig them. Tia does have to sit through UFC, doesn't she? Yeah, and she's exactly. going to sit through it this Saturday is what <laughs> she's going to do. She, was, she already texted me today. She was like, hey, um, when is it going to be off? And I was like, well, first of all, let's talk about when it's going to start. And that's going to be about 6 o'clock, and it's going to go off about 2. Jeez Louise. I love it. I can't wait. Of course. Gary dropped fucker on SportsCenter. Yeah, so that was great. Was that not awesome? Yeah. <laughs> Chris and I actually watched it live here. That's awesome. Like, <laughs> there was no dump button on that. It was just like, okay, cool. Was, was she oh. talking about the, the BMF belt? Is that, is that when she said it? Yeah. Doing UFC? That's yep. awesome. All right, Ethan. I want to wrap this up. It's already 8 o'clock. It's already, it's, eight, it's already 8 o'clock? Yep. It was a long night. We got started late. Um, it's all right, though. So this is episode 19. Chat with Gunner. Do us a favor. You know the drill. Go over to YouTube. If you're new, hit that subscribe button. Hit the bell notification so you know when the videos are uploaded. Head on over to Apple Podcasts. Scroll down. See where the stars are. Hit five stars. Leave a review. Leave the best podcast in Chattanooga. If you don't believe it, just don't leave a review. Don't be the dickhead that leaves a one-star review because we've had three of those. And if I find you, I will stomp your... Okay, relax. Calm down. Anyways, leave five-star reviews. Spotify, uh, if you only use Spotify, get an iPhone. But, you should pro- I mean, if you can leave reviews there, I haven't seen them, try it. Um, from what I noticed over the past week, to be serious, um, the Apple Podcast was the number one platform from last the last two weeks' shows, which is strange because it's usually been YouTube. But Apple Podcast is proving to be the number one outlet so far. So, all you Apple Podcast listeners, I appreciate you. Um, all you uh, people that are not pulling up the YouTube page, do that. That'd be awesome. That'd be great. I think that this is fun. Yeah, like anything, it's going to take several years of consistency before it's even anything. It's in its infancy stage. It, we are actually the we're in the the sperm stage. We're just being shot in. Right? Yeah, we're just being <laughs> shot in and being, being developed right now. We're like we're still in between like an egg and and even a fetus. We're just no heartbeat yet. No heart. Oh, no heartbeat. No heartbeat. You heartbeat. could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could. Yeah. I mean, you could. At this point, th- this thing could still be aborted. No worries. <laughs> Wouldn't be an issue. Nobody would care. Um, oh, my we, God. We get a few more episodes in, and we're, we're here. Yeah. You so, can't get rid of us at that point. So if you're, law trying, or no law. Yeah, if you're trying to pull the plug on this show, you better figure out a way to do it real fast because it's going to be here for a while. That's pretty much what we're saying. 
We're going to come out with a hairy beard on our face and a hair on our legs. And we're going to be, we're going to be a little bit of both. We're going to have both chromosomes coming out of this thing. We're going to, we're going to be a little bit of both. That just, what? Yeah. This podcast <laughs> is going, <laughs> this podcast, when it comes out, you're not going to know what it is, but it's going to say, I don't, I don't, uh, sorry, my phone's ringing, work, calling. I don't, uh, I don't consider myself a guy or a girl, is what this podcast is going to say. This podcast is going to say, I consider myself just the best. And uh, the best is. that is, what you say, Gunner? Yeah. Is that, a, is that a Gunner quote we can put on a t-shirt? Oh, no, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, this, this is a gender neutral podcast. This podcast is going to be kind of like uh, Caitlyn Jenner, you know. Start out as an Olympic gold medalist. Oh, man, this is the episode somebody's going to come back to and be like, these guys are assholes yeah. in about two years. You know, the, <laughs> the, the, the crazy thing about, you know, just being, here we go, ranting. The crazy thing about just being able to speak into a microphone and, and people listen to it is that they will only extract the stuff that they want to extract to make you look like the absolute biggest idiot possible. So this is probably the stuff that will come up in 20 years when I'm running for Congress. Yeah, I was going to say, there goes your presidency. Yeah. yeah you know what I'm saying? Oof. When, right, I'm, when I'm trying to be the mayor of East Ridge. East Ridge? Yeah, yeah. dude, they'll all go. Chattanooga, come good. on now. Yeah. All right. All right. Go for broke. Episode 8 of 19. 19. We'll see you next week, episode 20. So things coming up. We're going to do the, uh, the UTC – um, football companion shows where I get some of my boys in here and we're going to watch old game film, tell stories, locker room stories, party stories, all the cool things. And then we've got Kevin Mackley, I believe is his name, from the actor from Badlands wanting to come onto the show. We'll probably do that via webcam. Talk about how you stay in shape in Hollywood, how he's going to get his big break, and what it's like producing a number one rated Netflix film. So we'll talk about all of that, but until then, we will see you next week. Right here. Ciao.